All right, everybody, we're back. And our next guest is a hilarious uh, Long Island legend, I'd say, uh, comedian, uh, actor. Uh, he's been in everything from uh, from Nurse Jackie and Rescue Me to Top Gear. He's he's uh, done it all. Uh, here he is, ladies and gentlemen. Adam Ferrara is with us. Adam, how you doing, man? How are you, Don? Th thanks for having me uh, on the fairway. <laughs> I appreciate you uh, you being on the show. Um, what is the name of the show? The Back Nine. What are we doing? <laughs> this is the yeah the, my porch here. So I got the yeah. Sometimes gotta watch out for the. Uh, the golf course. If you hear anybody yell four, then you know I have to duck. Got it. I'm not to be with you, my friend. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, uh, this is awesome to have you on. Um, the the very first time I ever saw you uh, do stand up is when I was it was one of my first experiences in stand up club ever. Anyway, I was about 18 years old. I I um, fake ID'd it to get inside of East Side Comedy Club. Um, wow. It was a young Young Adam Ferrara was headlining. Uh, the middle act was Kevin James. And I believe the uh, MC was Richie Minervini. Uh -huh. It was uh, one heck of a great show. Um, and I always loved stand-up. That made me love the experience even more. Because, so you've always been near and dear to my heart. I mean, uh, watching your career blossom since that time of my life. I'm now 48. So mm -hmm. I've watched you through the years. I know that guy. I tell this story a million times. I've seen him. I... Uh, when he, way before he was famous and and all that. So well, that's very sweet of you, Don. And and when I do talk about that uh, that night to others, and I have, I was always kind and respectful of you. <laughs> Thank you for letting me be your first. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was great, and you did improv at the end. Um, that's the thing we used to do a lot of improv, Kevin and I especially, because um, we got signed with the same agency when we were kids, and we Don, we didn't have enough time to do a whole college show. <laughs> So right. we figured out what we could do is we could each do our little 20 minutes of stand up and then do the improv games, which we both learned at Eastside. Um, and that could fill a whole show. And that was our show. And that became the most important thing. Stand up became the most important thing to us. And I remember I was actually talking to um, Kevin on my podcast. And I remember that we were driving up Super Bowl Sunday in a blizzard. I think it was Super Bowl 25 when the Giants played uh, the Bills, the uh, Scott Norwood. Wide right, wide right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were listening to it on the radio, and uh, we had to pull over to hear the call because we were losing the radio station. So it's Super Bowl Sunday, and it was more important to us to drive up the thruway in a snowstorm to do a nooner at some community college <laughs> to stay home and watch the Super Bowl. <laughs> I, you know, I do. What's, funny, what's funny is I just, I just told that story to – I had Joe Buck on my podcast as well, and oh, wow. his father called on CBS radio – he was the guy calling wide right on the radio. So his uh, Jack Buck's voice is in my head every time I tell that story. And I got to share that with Joe Buck. We wait. There's a snap. There's a kick. It is up. It is. No good. No one missed. Four seconds left. The Giants have won Super Bowl 25 by the score of 20 to 19. But I, I do want to talk about the Talk to Me Tuesdays. Yeah. Um, because now in, in the quarantine that we're talking about in this world, it seems yeah. everybody uh, are now going Facebook Lives. Every, uh, every other- yeah. I've been doing it you, for years. Baby. You were way ahead of the curve. <laughs> you were doing these uh, very intimate Talk To Me t uh, Tuesdays for a long yeah. time. Intimate, use the word intimate. I use thousands of people uh, showing up every week to watch my wife scold me. That's pretty much <laughs> what it is. No, it, it's not like, yeah, it, I'm not Barbara Walters. He's gonna cry. It's my wife. <laughs> But you do. I say intimate because you, you answer every almost every question. You've answered a few yeah. of mine through the years. Yeah. Kevin's daughter was diagnosed with type one diabetes about three years ago. Your shows and live streams help us get through. Thank you, Kevin. Can't Glad we can help. Part. Best to you and the family, my friend. And it's always, it's always, it's a great thing to, for people to be able to interact. It's a connection. I mean, uh, the, the reason I got into stand-up was, one, it's the only place I went, okay, I can do this. It's like when you hit a golf ball right, you know? I mean, you could turn around and practice all you want. Most people don't have that advantage, Don. But <laughs> when you hit a golf ball right, you get that ping, you know? And when I got my first laugh, I got that ping. And it was the first time in my life I, 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 I knew beyond understanding that I belong here. I don't know how long it's gonna last, but this is where I need to be. 
So in, in knowing, in, in further trying to figure out why is the connection with the audience is what I need. Um, I, it's how I can be of service. This is what I, am, I can do. And it is my job given this, every, everyone comes into the life with a bag, of, a bag of tools and a bag of shit. You gotta get through your bag of shit and use your bag of tools. I, people, I can make people laugh. That's my job. Whatever's bothering you in this moment, I'm gonna make you laugh so you can't think about it for that moment. So when people come to see me do my show, my job is there's a guy, there's a girl putting food on the table, has one night out a week. Their friend said, you got to see this guy or we want you to see this guy. Whoever brought these other people with me or they saw me on TV, I'm making that experience for that hour. You're coming to see me. Whatever's bothering you, I'm going to take it away. That's and it. That's, how, that, that's how I can be of service. And that's how there's, there's maybe I'm deluding myself to put nobility into a bunch of dick jokes, but still it makes people happy. <laughs> <laughs> but I also think it's an essential job, especially in times like these. It, uh, I think, you know, comedy, laughter is the best medicine. And yeah, every, every job is essential in a society because that's how everything runs, you know? Exactly, yeah. What can you do? I got a buddy of mine who's a doctor. He's in Chicago. He's a doctor. He's an anesthesiologist. He's like, you know, I want to get back to work, but they won't let me. When I get back to work, I'll be able to do this. So what he's doing, he's volunteering. He's volunteering to help out because he does have medical knowledge, you know. Right, Plus, yeah. he's an anesthesiologist, so I, I'm pretty sure, like, he's, he's, he's at work like this. One for you, one for me. <laughs> one for you, <laughs> one for me. And that is essential as well in these days. That's how I'm getting through it, baby. <laughs> okay. A lot of people involved with an hour of dick jokes. Like my tail? Like your tail? I love it all. Wrap it up. I'll take two. One for the house, one for the car. Throughout your, your career, you, you've done a lot, man. You've uh, stand-up comedy has taken you into the acting, um, yeah. and and you you've been on everything. The job, rescue me, and like Nurse Jackie, and you always play, uh, at least in these three shows, either a cop or a fireman. Is that um, a, a, because of your New York swagger? Do you think, or why do you think you're drawn to play these roles? <laughs> I play a lot of cops on TV. I'll be honest with you, I really, I don't know why. Because if I was a cop in real life, I'd call for backup for no reason. I really would. This is car 54, I need some backup because I'm feeling kind of vulnerable. I get that a lot, Don. I used to, when I was, when I was younger, I used to get Mobster's Kid with a heart of gold. I would get that. Um, <laughs> I can see that. I played a political, uh, I, ran, I ran a political campaign in a movie with um, Ryan Reynolds. Uh, what the hell was his name? Um, Oh, definitely, maybe. So I got to do stuff like that. But mostly, yeah, it's, it's blue collar stuff. I guess because of the way I sound. Um, and uh, it's just what you walk in the door with. Right. So it, it's, I did play a bad guy on Law and Order. That was, that was fun. I got to play. I pl played the bad guy. I don't get a lot of them, but once in a while I get one of those. I, I played a dirty cop in a movie um, with um, Paul Sorvino and um, uh, Ralph Macchio. Uh, uh, yeah, I played a dirty cop. So that, that was fun, too, to play the bad guy. So yeah, you get this, you know, it's like I get a lot of uh, the cop. I, I'll be honest with you. I don't know why. If I was a cop in real life, Don, I'd call for backup for no reason. <laughs> I, this is car 54. I need some backup because I am feeling vulnerable at this moment. <laughs> Please bring the canine unit. I like to pet the dog. <laughs> It, when I, I did a, a little bit of acting, very small scale indie stuff, but in the South, when I lived in North Carolina for a little bit. And, and by they the always, South, you mean Levittown. Yeah, and they always cast me in mafia roles just because I have the Long Island. I'm, I'm not even fully full Italian. And I would always be this. The, for them, the, look at you. I'm looking them, at you right yeah. now. I'm waiting for the next sentence coming out of your mouth going, where's the juice? This is a little light. <laughs> little light this week. I hate to see you have to learn how to walk with a limp. No. <laughs> These are real Italian guys. I think the guys in my neighborhood like, hey, get the broad, get in the boat, come in. <laughs> Don't be a pussy. This is beautiful shit we got over here. I wanted to ask you, so all the different paths you took, whether it was stand-up, television, movies, Top mm -hmm. Gear, all these types of things, is there a favorite and... and uh, is there one, is it like do kids where you can't pick a favorite or are they all yeah, you love? Yeah, you know what it is? It's the experience of all of them is uh, what, I, what I'm taking and just looking back on doing all that stuff. The experience of all of them and being with those people in that creative environment is the same. And to have that opportunity 
is makes me extremely grateful to do so many diverse things. Plus, I have ADD, so I can't focus on one thing for too fucking long. But, <laughs> but to have that experience, Rescue Me was a family. It was, and it came from the job, this other cop show we did. All right, look, T, this day and age, I can't justify saying no to a guy based on the fact he likes cock. Uh, he goes to the union rep. The next thing you know, I'm up to I got you. I got you. So it was just being back with my friends and everything, and and you develop a shorthand. And we worked, man. Make no mistake. You work for Dennis Leary as long as I did. It's 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 trial by fire. There's live machine gun fire over your head. <laughs> pretty much. You 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 work hard and you play hard. Dennis is pretty much. You're gonna get two takes, and the second one better be funnier than the first. Action. Fuck. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, wow. And then we would improv. If he got bored, we would improv, so you had to know how to do it. So that show kept me on, on my toes. But it was very much a family. Same with uh, Nurse Jackie. Officer Varelli. Your phone broken? What are you doing here? I don't know. I figure you get to visit me at work. I thought maybe... Yeah, yeah not a good time. It was very much a family. I, um, I had Edie Falco on my podcast as, as well, and we, we told stories. And, and, that, and Top Gear, too. It was, we were together for six years, which was a very difficult show to do because we're on top of a mountain. <laughs> Just push that bitch. Push it right over. Oh, here it goes. Come on, here it is. Godspeed, Peggy. Fly. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh! So, uh, that's how I look back at all the experiences. Am I using a different muscle? Yeah. Am I using, it was funny. Uh, the distinct, I'll give you a distinction if that helps uh, answer your question is we all acted on the job rescue me. And then we would all go on tour and do the rescue me comedy tour. And that's when we were all together as comics. I was on right. a tour. It was me, Dennis Leary, Lenny Clark, uh, the band, Kenny Rogerson. So we all lived as comics. So that was a different context than, than, than acting. And we all watched each other's shows every night. So we would tag each other's lines. We would, we would, we would write together. We would enjoy, uh, we, we ate. Oh, we ate, like, we ate like a swarm of locusts because that's all that was left. <laughs> well, by the third year of the Rescue Me Comedy Tour, the booze was gone, the drugs were gone. We all got, we all got the girls we want, so you ate. <laughs> and you ate, ate after work. So after the show, it's midnight. They're walking us through the bowels of casino, like the Goodfellas scene. We're in a restaurant now, and there's steaks coming out. I'm eating porterhouse steaks at, at, at midnight, and I'm getting on a tour bus, and we're all farting like zoo monkeys heading to the next city. <laughs> Living like a rock star. Yeah. <laughs> but that's cool, too, to, to hang with all those, those uh, legendary Boston comics, too. You know, so, uh, Everyone thinks I was from Boston because very early on, I, I did a lot of things with Dennis and Lenny. So very early on, I, I got the – some people think I'm from Boston. Because, you know, you hear my accent, you know, you think Back Bay. Right. <laughs> Well, even with my Long Island accent, I one time, like, I, I was uh, interviewing, like, uh, Bill Burr over there, and he thought I was from Boston with my Long Island accent. Yeah. Uh, so I guess it's similar, but to me, it's not at all. But And people in the South are afraid of you, from what I understand. <laughs> yeah, they all think I'm mafioso. Mm -hmm. So now I want to just do, uh, before I let you go, this, this segment we have called uh, Comedy Questions. <laughs> what is your Mount Rushmore of comedy? Richard Pryor, uh, George Carlin, a guy named Chris Rush. He's since passed away, but he was a mentor and one of he opened up a door for me of what comedy could be. This is his. I got this in my desk. Nice. That's awesome. Chris Rush. Was a that's an that's an old. This is a cassette, kids. Years ago, when the Pilgrims <laughs> arrived, they that's had to awesome. walk. Chris Rush. That. And for me, I'm gonna. I gotta split the two. Only I gotta split between the three. The third, the fourth position. I want to put A, B, and C. My dad, only because he was funny as me, and 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 I just, I it, it was an influence, but it's not a public influence. So that's just for me. The other two is uh, Jackie Gleason and and uh, um, Jack Klugman. When I was a kid, you know, growing up in New York, 11, 11 o'clock, Channel Eleven, The Odd Couple's on. Odd eleven couple. thirty, The Honeymoons. And you would sneak out of, out of your room. Mom and dad would be downstairs watching TV. I would sneak into my parents' room, turn on the black and white set, listen to it. I was be on the phone with my friend Jimmy just as the, as the opening credits of The Honeymoons would start and so we could see who could guess the episode first. We could do it like that. Uh, and that's awesome. And go to bed. So the, I, not knowing that that stuff came into my, into my consciousness when I was a kid. I know when Pryor did. Um, when, I was a, when I was a kid, we went to a party with my parents. You know when you go to those parties with your parents and, and your mother gives you the warning in the car? 
like now don't like act like an animal because your father does business with these people you behave yourself <laughs> so they were down in the basement they watched uh richard Pryor live in concert all the adults and i was 12 maybe 11 12. they all went up to have coffee i went in i rewound the uh the vcr and i went whoa i i didn't know i was going to be a comic down but i knew this is important. Look what this man can do. Right, right. I mean, I said that out loud to nobody. And then my aunt gave me a couple of cassettes of uh, Carlin, and that was it. Awesome, man. Of all of your, this might be a difficult one, all your comedy special CDs and DVDs, mm -hmm. which one is your favorite? Uh, the uh, I like them all because I'm still getting residual money. <laughs> there you go. I don't know if my opinion is going to stop that passive passive flow, but in this pandemic, I need the cash, so I abstain from answering. <laughs> um, I will tell you that in one of my specials uh, uh, I did called Funny as Hell, my dad was ill at the time, and I wrote a bit about uh, my dad going to chemo. Came time for the chemo, and I sat my pop down, and we're in the garage, and I told him, I said, Pop, look, it's all taken care of. I got you into the best hospital in the city, all right? Don't ask me how, don't ask me why. Your name is on the top of that list. Now all I need you to do is walk through that door and I want you to beat this thing down, you hear me? I had the stones to, uh, not, not to pat myself on the back, but I wrote what I wanted to say. I brought the audience emotionally way down and I don't think I could have done that joke if I was a younger comic, knowing what I needed to do for the emotional release I wanted to have in the joke. So, Pop, look at me. I got you the best shot we got at beating this. Yeah, I know, son. And uh, I looked at that city hospital, I really did, but this is gonna be a two, three month deal and where you gotta go, it's got all those stairs and <laughs> your mother don't climb the stairs that good no more. So that can't work for us. He's looking right down the barrel at it, and his priority is my mother can't climb those stairs no more. That's the same man made me shovel the driveway with a broken arm. So I took the chance, I did it, and when it got released, um, it helped a great deal of people. And I got a call from uh, Professor Eddie Freefeld, who taught at uh, Yale Drama, up uh, a Yale and NYU um, he reached out to my manager and said um, we want to license this bit as a teaching tool and I got that call and I went free take it in <laughs> God bless you so that bit I will I will I will distinguish that bit because it went on to have a bigger life Wow very cool and that, yeah. that does take a, a, a lot of uh, moxie if you will on stage to kind of uh, have have the the balls to bring the down and then get them back again. And, and yeah, but let's, hey, let's be honest, Don. It's artistic courage. I'm not running into a fucking burning building. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. But yeah, it's still when you're on stage, and uh, you know, and, and you take the, the risk to to uh, get serious or or bring it the, the down. You know, the mood down. When you pull out control. quick because nobody wants to stay there. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> pull up on the stick. Pull up on the stick. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, best comedy advice you ever got from a fellow comedian? Uh, from a fellow comedian? Mm, I will give you the best advice, life advice I got from a fellow artist. I think it was it was my acting coach. It was basically, it ain't fair and don't be late. <laughs> awesome. Um, do you remember the very first time you did stand up? And how, how did it go? July 13th, 1988, Eastside Comedy Club, the one that was on Jericho Turnpike, was a Wednesday night. It was an open mic night. Awesome. So the answer is yes. <laughs> and do you remember what you were wearing? Or... <laughs> I, I remember the sh I, I remember I had a brand new pair of high top Chuck Taylors, black and white ones. I remember because I had them on my desk in New York. I had them up on the shelves. And for some reason, I put candles in them because I didn't have shoot trees. So they were sitting on the shelf of my desk and my wife, and I used them as bookends. And my wife came in and went, you're a grown man. And I went, well, she wasn't my wife, then. she was my girlfriend. She said, you're a grown man. I go, those are my first sneakers. <laughs> the meaning. She's like, they smell like feet. They smell like feet <laughs> and candles. And I think I, I'm pretty sure she got, I, oh, I, I know what I did. I donated them. Someone wrapped, some silent auction wrapped them off. So well, that was it. What is your, your best bomb story? 
I was doing a uh, I was doing a gig. Corporate gigs are, are nice. Every comic knows corporate gigs, great money, uh, but they're away games. Anytime you go to them, it's an away game. So you just put that in your head. So right. I always try to go up after the meal. You don't want to have clanking forks and eating stuff. And they're corporate gigs, so they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> so I did. I got a gig to do. It was very early, early on in my career, and I got a gig at the uh, for uh, oncologists, for cancer doctors, at the Fountain Blue Hotel in Miami. Jackie Gleason show came out of the Fountain Blue. The answer is yes, right? Yeah. So I went down. I did the gig, and um, big, big ballroom filled with people. The meal is over. They got two uh, big screens up here and a podium in the middle. And there's a doctor up there. And the doctor mixed my intro in with his closing announcements. <laughs> and there's two cells on these screens. There's a cell here, a cell here, the guy's at the podium. And he's like, uh, uh, we want to thank Arthur for his generous donation to our foundation. Our, our comedian tonight is Adam Ferrara. And we have to be vigilant because there is no cure. Keep up the good work. And he walks <laughs> Dead silence. Nobody knows who I am. I walk out. They're just staring at me. There's a mic stand. I grabbed the mic stand and I said, okay, my name's Adam Ferrar. I'm a comedian, but just to review. And I took the mic stand and I pointed at the two cells. I went, benign, malignant. Benign, <laughs> malignant. Nothing. I guess I got it wrong. I guess those were the other ones. I no idea. <laughs> So nothing. So I had to dig out of that hole. And eventually, you know, I I, I got out of it. But that was that wow. was a long slog, baby. That's tough, man. Yeah. <laughs> what is the best part to you for being a stand-up comedian? What's your favorite thing about being a stand-up I like comedian? the cash. That's <laughs> what so I thought you were going to say. <laughs> I have a mortgage and a wife. She eats every day. No, the, the best part for me is... Whether it's good or whether it's bad, I know it's what I should be doing. So that takes a lot of anxiety away because, you know, how are you going to deal with what is? Like, oh, what if I, there is no what if I, you're here, this is it, this is what you do, do it. So that's the best part of it, is, is I, 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 I found my place early and I'm grateful for it. However long it lasts is out of my control. Where could people find you what do you got at coming adam, up at adam ferrara on all the socials uh talk to me tuesday is nine o'clock eastern 6 p.m pacific on tuesdays you go to my website click the link come join the conversation my podcast is called the adam ferrara podcast 30 minutes you'll never get back uh it's a lot of fun i've had kevin james on i've had um jay leno tony kohenheiser if you're a sports fan uh anthony edwards is coming up uh, i got to talk to goose from top gun i actually got to say talk to me goose and oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, Richard Marks. Um, I had Katie, Katie Coleman, the astronaut. She lived in space for six months. Wow. And I got to speak to her. She was a flautist, Don. She, she played the flute with Ian Anderson from Jethro Tull from space. Wow. And she, yeah. I've done nothing with my life. Talk about bucket list. <laughs> yeah. I think I mentioned I spoke to Joe Buck, so I got to ask him about uh, a bunch of calls he made. Um, uh, Aisha Tyler's coming up. Uh, oh, nice. If you're a car fan, Richard Hammond from uh, – the UK Top Gear. Um, so I'm having a, a lot of fun. Uh, come by, listen to the podcast. Come by, talk to me Tuesdays. I appreciate everyone uh, out there. Please, best to everyone in their family. Stay safe and wash it twice. Can't hurt. There you go. Adam Ferrara, thank you very much. All the best to you and yours over there in LA. And uh, yeah, man, when you come back to Long Island, make sure you stop in and say hello. We'll be in the governor's room in the back room. I think the last time you were there, you actually peeked your head into the station while we were doing our show. Um, oh, yeah, it's fun. Governor's yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. Tell so, Jimmy I said hello, and I can't wait to come back. You got it, my friend. Take care, man. Thanks again for everything. All right, be well.